of the United States. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President, members of the Congress, I speak tonight for the dignity of man and the destiny of democracy. I will send to Congress a law designed to eliminate illegal barriers to the right to vote. You know, you often hear that the Voting Rights Act um, is regarded as the crown jewel of uh, the civil rights statutes that were passed in the 1960s. And one of the reasons that the Voting Rights Act is regarded as the crown jewel is because it contained within it a provision that Congress at the time and civil rights activists thought was in many ways the most important and ingenious provision in any civil rights statute. And the, the provision um, is known colloquially as the preclearance provision. But what that preclearance provision did was it required any jurisdiction that was covered by a certain formula within the statute um, that if that jurisdiction wanted to change anything about their election system, if they wanted to move polling places, if they wanted to expand the number of seats on the county council, they would have to have those changes pre-cleared by a federal authority, either the Attorney General of the United States or a federal district court in Washington, D.C. So what Congress did when they created this preclearance uh, requirement is they essentially said they wanted to root out um, the ingenious methods of discrimination that might be thought of in the future. In other words, they recognize that we might not know today in 1965 um, what, for example, voter ID laws, something that we're dealing with now, right, might do and how they might be created to suppress the black vote. So that's the preclearance provision. That's how it worked. And it worked ingeniously for years, for decades, until the Supreme Court's decision in the Shelby County versus Holter case. First, though, a landmark day for the Supreme Court as it struck down a key section of the landmark Voting Rights Act that was created to prevent discrimination at polling places. This is a critical day for democratic participation in America. This decision by the court is a game changer and leaves virtually unprotected minority voters in communities all over this country. So um, we were arguing the case. One of our lawyers um, was in the, the well of the court to argue the case, and it was a packed courtroom. We had brought our clients from Shelby County to hear the case, and I was sitting uh, with the clients uh, in the public section, and there were, there were uh, historic civil rights warriors and activists who came to hear the argument that day, and media figures and politicians, and so it was a packed Supreme Court uh, courtroom, and you could feel the, the tension around this argument. It became very apparent fairly early on that there was tremendous hostility to the maintenance of preclearance in the questions from the Chief Justice, um, in the questions from Justice Kennedy, who we regarded as the swing vote, um, and most certainly from Justice Scalia, who was still alive at that point, and who described, as I remember, the Voting Rights Act in that argument as um, racial entitlement for black voters. I think it is attributed, very likely attributable, to a phenomenon uh, that is called, called uh, perpetuation of racial entitlement. Whenever a society adopts racial entitlements, it is very difficult to get out of them through the normal political processes. And, I, and what I remember is I was sitting with one of our clients who's since passed away, Earl Cunningham, who was, uh, I think, 83 or 84 at the time, and he was sitting next to me. And I can remember when Justice Scalia described the Voting Rights Act as a racial entitlement, the way he sucked in his breath. I'll never forget it. And so we, we were not particularly hopeful when we left the courtroom that day. And then, of course, when we read the decision, um, obviously it was dismaying because of the result of the decision, but it was also dismaying because of the, the language of the decision and because of the court's unwillingness to credit, first of all, a nearly unanimous Congress that had just reauthorized this in 2006. I am proud to sign the Voting Rights Act Reauthorization and Amendments Act of 2006. But also the court engaging in a little bit of magical thinking about the state of, of race and racism in this country. You know, deciding that, um, you know, we, we have come so far that we no longer need this preclearance requirement. So since the Shelby decision, um, jurisdictions all over the country, but particularly in the, in the jurisdictions that used to be covered by preclearance, 
have um, adopted a number of schemes to try to suppress the minority vote. Uh, some of them are these voter ID laws. Some people, you know, wonder about these voter ID laws. Where did they come from? Why, ha why has this become, you know, the principal means of voter suppression? I mean, I would say, you know, if you find something that works, you stick with it. And I think those who have committed themselves to suppressing African-American and Latino voters have recognized that voter ID laws are astonishingly successful at doing so, right? So there are all kinds of forms of ID that were permissible prior to these voter ID laws. No, these voter ID laws are premised on the idea of creating an, a form of identification that is going to require voters to go through hoops in order to get it. Now, what kind of voters am I talking about? Well, this is where the rubber meets the road, right? The average middle class or upper middle class voter will say, I have a driver's license or I have a passport. Um, I think most people know most Americans don't have passports. Um, there are many people who don't have a driver's license. I'm a New Yorker. I didn't get a driver's license till I was 30. Um, but then people say, well, you go to the Motor Vehicle Bureau and you can get a non-driver's driver's license. Well, that's great if, if you can get on the subway, as you can in New York, and get that driver's license and get to that, that local motor vehicle office. But if you live in rural places and you have to drive, and these motor vehicle offices are few and far between, and they're not open on the weekend, and they're not open in the evenings, and when you get there, then you've got to have the underlying identification that would allow them to give you the ID that you need to vote. For example, that you have to have a birth certificate. Well, some of us have our birth certificate and some of us don't. Some of us wouldn't know how to get it. So it may cost you $15 to get the birth certificate. So you have to now add the travel costs, the time off work, the $15, all to get the voter ID so that you can exercise this right that the Supreme Court in 1886 said was preservative of all rights, the right to vote. President-elect Trump has been quite active on Twitter, and he said, in addition to winning the Electoral College in a landslide, I won the popular vote if you deduct the millions of people who voted illegally. The president-elect is absolutely correct when he says the number of illegal votes cast <laughs> exceeds the popular vote margin between him and Hillary Clinton. Our next guest, Greg Phillips, first tweeted the claim that three million people voted illegally. Do you know and can you prove right now that three million people voted illegally? Yes. Do you have the proof? Yes. Will you provide it? Yes. Can I have it? No. The myth of voter fraud, the search, the search for the unicorn of in-person voter fraud um, is really one of the biggest scams, um, you know, b kind of biggest uh, civic scams in our democracy, where you have a set of individuals, um, all of whom by virtue of their uh, education should know better, who have continued to perpetuate the myth that in-person voter fraud is a problem in the United States. And there have been any number of studies that have demonstrated that, you know, in-person voter fraud is um, extremely rare, right? That you have a, a higher chance of being struck by lightning uh, than encountering in-person voter fraud. I mean, and that's an actual finding, right? So, um, so it's not something that exists in any large measure. Um, to the extent that voter fraud exists, it actually is not in-person voting fraud. It's people, you know, sending in absentee ballots, right, that, um, that are not, you know, that are not theirs. But people showing up, think about what that takes. You would actually show up at a polling place and stand in front of somebody and claim to be somebody that you're not, right, um, all to cast a ballot to change the outcome. Among the list of crimes, this is not one that is prevalent in this country, just ha happens not to be. And yet there are those who have an interest in perpetuating the idea that this in-person voter fraud exists. And sadly, one of those people now happens to be our president. But people will. They'll vote many times. Somebody coming up and voting 15 times for Hillary. So we're, we're about to see the nationalizing of the myth of voter fraud. And I will not tell you to vote 15 times. You won't vote 15 times. Why would you want to support this fantasy? Because that fantasy lays the platform, lays the foundation for more voter suppression tactics. Because now you can get the public believing that our election system is under threat. I think at this particular moment, we know that there are many things that are threatening our election system. In-person voter fraud, is not one of them. This is part of, I think, the crisis that we're facing in this country. 
to the extent that protecting the right to vote is regarded as a partisan exercise, I mean, that is a powerful moment in our democracy that we have to explore. The Voting Rights Act itself was never a partisan act. It was never a, a bill about Democrats or Republicans. It was always understood that the very character of our democracy was that we wanted to ensure that, um, that there, there could not be, there could not be the suppression of the votes of racial minorities, that that was a stain on all of us, whatever your political party or race. And it's only in the last few years that we've seen this become part of the partisan battleground in a way that I think is really toxic for our democracy. Part of the challenge I think we face right now is getting out of that, is getting people to understand that whatever your political party, if you believe in this country, if you believe in the principles that we advance throughout the world about this country, if you believe in our national character, then you have to support uh, efforts to promote the ability of people to participate in the political process, and you must support the condemnation of anyone who would try to intimidate voters uh, and who would try to target voters because of their race and make it harder for them to participate in the political process.